that my name is Ren. Um, and the pronouns are tra challenging, can be challenging. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I'm excited to share with you some of the research that I've been engaged in. Um, kind of catch phrase, farm to fridge is the idea. Um, and we'll jump into that. So it is a graduate student grant. I, as Beth said, I work full time for the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships at the University of Minnesota Extension. Everything has long titles. <laughs> um, so, but then I'm also a graduate student with the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Science and Natural Resource Science Management um, as a master's student. On this project, I had a couple farmer advisors, um, Laura and Joan, as well as my faculty advisor, Dr. Nick Jordan, and then co-advised by Dr. Kathy Drager, who also happens to be the statewide director of the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Lots of connections here. And speaking of connections, this, this grant, um, instead of like trying to write out a one, two, three for these different components of the project, I uh, put it into a circle. <laughs> um, so I'll be talking about the existing back home project, um, some interviews and a couple different surveys that were done that I plugged into as part of this project, and then potential outreach that we've started to do and that, that's to come. So Farm to Search, um, here's the project model. Um, the idea is that farm, looking at smaller and maybe mid-sized farmers who aren't selling um, beyond like the farmer's market or direct, very direct to consumer type of situations. Um, so what are kind of some of those things that can be barriers to accessing larger markets um, like retail or wholesale uh, and post-harvest handling is something that's come up in a lot of conversations that I've been a part of. And part of that is cold storage or refrigeration. Um, and so there's multiple barriers, and that's what I kind of wanted to explore based upon conversations I have had. I, I work with produce farmers, and I also do work with small town grocery stores. So this all is very connected um, with my role in extension. And so I wanted to take that, that research piece um, to see if there could be a connection made between the two. So the momentum, as I said, um, cold chains and market access for farmers, um, understanding uh, what those needs are, Connecting it to this backhaul project, looking at rural communities and food access, as we heard, I mean, it's something that's been talked about a lot throughout this conference. Um, and then outreach, there are other extension educators I work with, um, as well as farmers and community partners who are interested in this topic and this type of research. Um, so my research questions, uh, what are the barriers small, mid-sized Minnesota fruit and vegetable farmers face due to refrigeration or lack of? Um, what is the current availability of excess underutilized refrigeration in rural grocery stores? And what might be the impact of connecting farmers to existing refrigeration? Uh, so starting with this backhaul project, um, has anyone heard about the, yeah, okay. So the presentation about yeah, that last year. Yeah, yeah, yep, exactly, cool. Um, so here's that, this concept, um, and it, we tried it out. The university made a really like, beautiful video on it, and we have tried it again, um, and we have like, a, a protocol that's in draft on it. The idea is that um, the farmer, uh, and we start with garlic, connects with the rural grocery store nearest to them and uses the existing infrastructure. So when thinking about transportation and how to get produce into, into the marketplace, um, you're utilizing an empty wholesale truck that usually makes deliveries at that grocery store and then will bring it to the wholesaler and distribute it out. So my project focuses on that connection between the grocery store and the farmer. Um, I don't have time to show you the video, but take a look. <laughs> um, so the interviews that I did, um, again, addressing research question one, there were interviews and there were also um, a farmer survey. So the interview research process, I started with the central research question, and this was qualitative research, that, this aspect. Um, and so looking at like their perceived business success and kind of broadening it, broadening that question versus like, how does this hurt your farm? Like trying to think about things in, in, in not always negative <laughs> um, lenses. Uh, so data collection um, with literature review, and I interviewed four beginning farmers they were pretty in-depth interviews. I mean, one, I ended up like having dinner with them and <laughs> like <laughs> didn't leave until like after nine um, from their farm. So they were very interested in this topic. Um, so I transcribed those, uh, used a, um, a kind of a data matrix uh, to pull out themes and look at relationships. Um, and then looking at the, the lens of sustainability uh, with these interviews, so economic, 
um, social and environment um, on how refrigeration was impacting their farms. Uh, and then, uh, you know, looking at that in terms of how does it address this, this idea of their business success um, with these assumptions and this red triangle that informs this, that refrigeration is needed because it extends the life of produce, um, it can help you, because of that, access different markets, and um, over this overall want uh, that we, we want more farmers on the landscape that's sustainable. Um, so I, this could be a whole presentation too. <laughs> um, so I shared a few, I picked a few key quotes. Um, so they all have pseudonyms, uh, <coughs> drawn. that's the biggest problem. We are getting up before 4 a.m. in the morning, so if we had a walk-in refrigerator, then we could save all those, you know, we could save so much time, really. Um, so just looking at their own, how this impact impacted them personally um, and their like time in life um, and commitments that they couldn't make because they couldn't store it. It's constant, like you got the produce, but you put it out. Um, so here's another quote from Ethan. Uh, two years ago, we had a bazillion onions. We pretty much lost all, almost all of it just because we did not have a proper refrigeration. Um, and they it also grew. They didn't. They had issues with their barn, and um, but they had to address a ro re leaky roof, um, and so they're trying to figure out even how or where to store. So there's it's, it's not just refrigeration, right? There's multiple things that impact this. But um, so Laura said, I mean, we can't show them the community if we don't have the tools to show them how viable it is to grow it up here. It's not sustainable if we don't have refrigeration being one of it, one of the things. But it's how to take care of the land and everything. So she was looking more of a like waste perspective. Um, and I say waste loosely because farmers that I work with are typically very resourceful and compost, right? So it's returning some of those nutrients, but if you're looking at profit, <laughs> it's considered waste. Um, Corey said, we're all doing this and we're feeling good about it. Gosh darn it. We're all a bunch of hippies and we're raising our plants. We've got our high tunnels and we're at our farmer's market and no one's showing up and it's raining and I still got to be here. Um, so he was a, um, the most pessimistic of his current situation um, out of the farmers. So here's a kind of a recap of my results and, and some of those, the themes I talked about, um, the social economic environment. So first, the lifestyle and interactions with communities, and how refrigeration impacted that, and kind of their, yeah, like I mentioned, like the hours of operation that they're running their farm. Um, the profitability of the farm, and then farm practices and food waste. And so considering some of these implications, like trade-offs that they're making, access to different markets and imbalances, um, and, and how to look at sustainability with farms in, with this piece. Um, so moving on to the Produce Farmer Survey. Um, and so I, I put out a call. Um, it was a, a, through different social media chat, like outlets, um, as well as a few different listservs and organizations um, around the state of Minnesota. So this is all focused in Minnesota. Um, and the, 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 a needs assessment on refrigeration had, from the university's perspective, or institutional knowledge, um, had not been done since 1992. Um, so this is as old as I am, the data that exists on, on these needs. Um, and so I was able to work with Dr. Cindy Tong, um, so she's the, pr the professor that did that survey with some, called the, some of her students, um, and she helped form some of the questions and like, gave some input as well. Um, so we did it in Qualtrics. And there were 70 farmers that responded. Um, I asked for zip codes um, voluntarily. So here's the farmers that provided their zip codes. Um, on average, they had about five acres that they were involved with farming. They were both farmers who owned farms and who were working on farms. Um, on average, they had been farming for 13 years, which surprised me, because I was, you know, that was, a, that was really interesting. <laughs> I think that, um, to, do, to dig into this deeper, I would want to target even more specifically beginning farmers. So like today, there's an emerging farmers conference, <laughs> um, and I do have an extension educator friend who's there, um, and I'm like, if you have some conversations or you know want to like ask a few questions about refrigeration tangentially, like let me know. Um, but anyway, so this survey, um, half are were planning to increase cold storage in their farm, and, and in the future wanted to and wanted to expand their farm. So that was encouraging to hear. Um, and the majority of them were using some kind of refrigeration. Um, so 80% of the respondents. Um, so they had a walk-in size refrigerator, which, um, I, you know, that's, yeah. And they talked about the age, which I'll get in a second, um, two-door reach-in, and then also like a household size was the most common, and a few root cellars as well. So considering not just electrified or uh, electric refrigeration 
Um, so the average age of the refrigerators were ten, a little bit more than 10 years old. Um, so consider, you know, um, yeah, energy costs with that and, you know, and, and making do with what's available. Um, why does your farm not have, so that 20% um, that did not have cold storage, unsurprisingly, uh, is too expensive to purchase. Um, and then also the farm size, they're just not ready or to need to store things to, for a certain amount of time. Um, so we also I asked, also asked where they found information on cold storage and especially um, like from an extension perspective, right? Everyone wants fact sheets and you want to be able to make the resources available. Um, and the majority was Google searches and then from peers and other growers. And I think this is um, a lack. We have um, like some of my coworkers I work with are post-harvest specialists and um, like down to the temperature of different crops and things like that that, that can store for longevity or different qualities. Um, so I think that's an opportunity, which I mentioned, mentioned later again. Um, do you wish you had more access to cold storage? Yes, the uh, majority of farmers. Um, and then how would it impact your farm you work on? Or, or the farm you work on, the farm, your farm. Um, produce would stay fresher longer and then reducing the amount of <coughs> produce and less pressure to find immediate buyers. And so I'm thinking like the stores I work with and the wholesalers I work with, that quality piece is like continually coming up. Um, so that's definitely farmers, it's a no brainer. Like the post stars handling matters, the impact, the longevity of the produce. Um, so would access, so this is then connecting it to the grocer. Would access to off-farm cold storage or refrigeration be useful to your farm? So looking at non-conventional ways to access refrigeration, for, especially for farms who may not have the, the dollar resources or need to spend like loan dollars on, on bigger needs like barn roofs. Um, and so there was 41% uh, of the farmers thought that this could potentially be useful. Um, on one hand, farmers said, I don't trust this option, it tends to be expensive, and we have had problems with mold and other issues in shared cooler space we used to use. So I was really glad they were honest about that challenge. Um, but on, you know, refrigeration is expensive, transporting produce to um, and from a site, a storage site, is also potentially expensive. So, you know, different, different opinions. Off-farm cold storage seems like a good idea, something we'd be interested in before installing our own. Our operation is very small, and we found ways around electrified cold storage that meets our needs. Someone's a good idea. <laughs> um, okay, so with that in mind, the produce farmer survey, I'll move on to the rural grocery store survey. And this addresses the, the research question, what is the current availability? Um, is, that, is there potential for leasing excess um, refrigeration space? And this exists in, within the larger context of a, quite a few communities struggling to keep grocery stores in their communities. Um, and and, and I, I do work with a team called the Support Our Stores team, um, and connecting grocery stores with different professionals with different resources. Um, so this was in Fairfax, Minnesota. Um, so that's just another thing, a very important thing in the context of connecting grocery stores and farmers. Um, the survey that we did is, was an update from a 2015 survey. So this year's survey, I literally got the, the final data back on Wednesday this week. Um, so I was really excited for, to share some of it with you for this presentation. It was 20 pages. It was a big ask for really busy small business owners. Um, 80 questions long. We mailed it out to, uh, to 250 grocers and it had a 55% response rate. Um, so they took the time to fill out the survey. Um, so with it though, we sent a postcard, or well, like a comment card, and this was ways that they could actually interact with us who were administrating it. So we weren't just taking information from them, um, we wanted the grocers to have access to any resources we could provide, um, so it kind of feel like a reciprocal relationship a bit. Um, and this was, this was also, um, the, both the produce farmer survey and its grocery survey were developed with the audiences. So grocers reviewed this, added questions, said, no, that question actually isn't very pertinent, like that kind of stuff. Um, so in particular, I included a question on there. I would like help connecting with local farmers to buy products, fruits and vegetables, meat and cheese, or other local food items for my store. Um, and so 58% of the stores that filled out this comment card um, said, yes, please connect me to farmers. So that was great. I was like, now we have names, addresses, emails um, of grocery stores who say, like, took the time to, to fill out the survey and, and send it back in. Um, it was pre-stamped. 
Um, but yeah, and yeah, so I was like, oh, that's great. And in fact, um, I took a second to, if I can get over here, um, give it a second. Nope. Oh, it's around the side now. <laughs> I don't know which way my mouse is going. Okay, here we go. Um, so here are the stores that said they wanted help connecting to farmers. Um, and so this is like a really cool um, way to use data and to like make it real time and like actually show this, these are potential market outlets. Um, so I just wanted to show that. Um, so if all, we also included a question, if all regulatory issues were addressed, would you consider leasing some of your refrigeration space to local farmers or local processors? Um, and the majority said no, like that's too much, I don't have enough staff as it is, I, I use all my space, it's too, like I, I don't have a schedule even when I know it's full, that kind of stuff. But there were 21% that said maybe, and then I don't remember how much, a, a sliver of that that said yes. Um, so I think that they, uh, the majority of them said, thought it would not be possible, um, but there was that, that few that said this could be potential to try. And so if not, you know, with this, uh, the refrigeration question aside, it's still really encouraging that they want to buy produce um, in general. Um, we also asked, what are the greatest barriers to selling locally grown produce, fresh produce? And this was like the, like, curly, like, I was like, ah, understanding the rules and regulations for selling local produce um, was the biggest, so they, they had, opt, like, all these things they could check, like, the top three, and then we asked them for the number one. Um, below that was sufficient supply of local produce to sell, so they can't get their hands on enough of it. Um, and then maintaining the shelf life. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, they, uh, things like, you know, low customer interest was like very low, which I think is cool. Um, you know, weather, like the delivery dates, that kind of stuff was low on the, on the, the very used to weather issues. Yeah, they're like, yeah, no, that, sometimes my grocery truck doesn't, you know, show up. So, um, and then we asked them, have they ever turned farmers away because of their understanding of are, are be, being uncertain about the regulations of purchasing local food from farmers. And this yes, like they 29% who answered this survey said they had turned farmers away. I was like, wow, like they can do something about this. Um, and then 45% say I'm already purchasing. Um, and then 22 hadn't even been contacted by farmers in their community. Um, so I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so with these things in mind, um, some of these preliminary takeaways, uh, the education of the um, legality of selling fresh produce to grocery stores is something that I'm like wanting to jump on. Um, the 21% of the surveyed stores are interested in exploring options of leasing space. 41% of the farmers surveyed um, said that might be an interesting option for my farm. Um, looking at beginning farmers or farmers who have access, like um, don't have access to other resources or um, may have had to use loans and other things for other things on their farm. Um, and then looking at other considerations of existing uh, refrigeration in communities, like the town I grew up in um, had, a, well, the neighboring town, had a county fair and they had a commercial kitchen and a really nice walk-in cooler. <laughs> and for a majority of that year, I mean, it's used every so often for some events and things like that or like different expos. Um, but that, you know, like thinking about being creative and thinking outside of the box versus, um, you know, I need to buy this $10,000 piece of equipment or, you know, something like that. So, um, so looking at outreach, so what next? Uh, what might be the impact of connecting the two? Uh, so with this grant, like thinking about how attitudes might change. And that attitude or the understanding of grocery stores, of the small town stores, these are, I, sh I failed to mention, but in communities less than 2,500, so we're talking small towns, small independently owned stores, um, that misconception about regulations, um, that's an easy one to change. There's been a lot of work by different organizations to make the laws so that it's legal to sell um, fresh produce specifically, and then we even like meet the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Egg has fact sheets on like selling eggs and meat, and like it goes on and on. <laughs> Um, and so the real, strengthening relationships, um, talking about knowing your neighbor, knowing your business owner, um, farmers making the, like, helping in, and encouraging those connections to happen. 
Um, so with that knowledge and like the, the legislation piece and legality, um, we've used the survey data from the grocery store specifically and their want, um, this is from the 2015, but there's like, I don't remember the percentage off the top of my head, but in 2015, a majority of stores also wanted to buy more produce from farmers. Um, and so we testified with that. So this is um, the Dean of Extension on the left, or your right, um, and then Dr. Drager with Representative Jean Poppy um, at the Ag Food and Finance Committee. Um, and then I, I testified here, this is Representative, or Senator Johnson from just north of here. Um, and this was specifically looking at the Good Food Access Program. Um, but I think knowledge is power and like I'm all about sharing it and on that level as well. So looking about outreach from this survey and from um, the work we're doing with small town grocery stores, we're working on different um, like customer management like ideas and how to better store that and share that kind of information. We're also working on a farm to grocery toolkit that um, can be a, like a tool for farmers and grocers, both as an audience. Um, so grocers have questions like, is it legal? <laughs> um, and then farmers that I've talked with have also had questions about packaging, about washing, um, about pricing uh, and deliver and what questions to ask. How to make an invoice even is some, some conversations I've had. Um, so we're gonna be looking at specifically at beginning farmers who may have not sold beyond the farmer's market. Um, so that's another project in the hopper um, as well. And we have both brochure advisors and farmers involved on that. And I think this survey data fits really nicely into that project. So uh, with that circular uh, kind of flow of this project, I'm happy to connect, um, and if you have ideas or have looked into alternative refrigeration options or buying relationships, um, I'd love to chat more. So thank you. Any questions? Has anybody thought about used reefer trailers? Used reefer trailers? Yeah, I didn't get any comments back on the survey about that, um, but I do know farmers are are using. You know, you don't have to have a diesel motor running all the time. You can convert them to, to an like, electric trade trade. To them. Yeah, there's a farm I, I visited in actually in northern Iowa who did buy like a, a, one of the longer size reefer trucks. Yeah. Yeah, the um, grocery stores that said no, that they didn't want to share their cooler space. Did they elaborate more on that? And are you kind of elaborating? Yeah, on yeah, I have quite a few. We, we had a fill in the blank next to it, like a box. Um, and I do have all the raw data for that. Um, and it, like, there were some that were like a few sentences. There were a couple like longer answers. Um, but yeah, it was mostly time, space, um, and like kind of the trust issue on their responses. I'm going to go back to processing and do you know if any of the grocery stores that you um, surveyed or anything had, say, a commercial kitchen space? Yeah, we asked that. We asked if they had a meat cutting counter, um, if they do meet like any type of uh, pro like uh, processing. We asked if they um, had a co yeah commercial like prep area to sell food. Um, and I don't have the data ready, but I know it's in the question. <laughs> and we will be publishing the survey results on, on RSDP's um, website. Yeah. Are these farmers willing to have someone pick that product up similar to what this other lady was talking about? I mean, and, and get it to a central location? Yeah, so, well, so picking the product up on their farm. Yeah, do they not feel that it's identity preserved, so to speak, if someone's picking it up, do they want to deliver it to the end user, is that? Yeah, I'm not sure, I didn't like really look into that question, but that is a, yeah, that's a, a good question that would be good to ask. Um, I know we also asked the grocery stores if they would be aggregation sites, and I don't have the data on that, but I know we asked the question. <laughs> um, with that identity preservation, um, I know we've had conversations with garlic growers and they have far less concern about identity um, preservation. They mostly just want to sell their garlic, like they just want it out. And the Minnesota Premium Garlic Project is doing quite a bit of work on that with the Sustainable Farming Association. Um, but identity preservation, and also traceability and like from a food safety perspective. Um, so some of my time I spend training produce farmers on the new FSMA um, Food Safety Modernization Act, produce safety rule. 
And so that's another consideration with transferring and aggregation, that kind of stuff. We heard a little bit earlier too. Just want, we were yeah. involved in, in long haul trucking across the United States, so we pick up in California and go all the way to the East Coast. And a lot of times, well, blueberries for instance, we pick those up and we had one load that we got into Boston and it, and it was bad and they rejected it. Um, and you know, obviously at certain times of the year, everyone has produce, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I never, I know there's a lot of uh, farms in Minnesota and I know how hard they work, but it's not, it doesn't seem like it's as organized as California is per se, because a lot of them have, you know, the, the cooler that, I mean, the farm is just right up in Salinas Valley, Valley for instance. It's right out there and then they bring it into the cold storage and the semi is taken away. And I know that, you know, we want to have a local market, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, the winter kind of disrupts yeah. everything involved. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the, the infrastructure and the size of farms, I mean, we definitely have smaller farms here, but we have a, quite a few far, smaller farms. And so I think there's strength in numbers in that sense um, with more co coordination and support. Um, I mean, our farmers are intelligent and scrappy and you know like interested in getting their product to communities um I just, it just seems yeah. like if you meld both of these situations together it shouldn't work it's just yeah. to get everybody on board to yeah do it. yeah 